Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Cambridge Festival, our little springtime, well, not little, it's quite wide and diverse, springtime celebration of research. And we hope that this short panel will be fun and engaging for you. It's quite an experimental little form for us. It is part of a larger project on shared sacred landscapes, uh, which you can check out at sharedsacred.com. We'll have some exhibitions, symposia to come. Um, please do join us for those as well. Uh, this is a project supported by the Public Engagement Starter Fund, uh, and it's part of the wider work we do at the Cambridge Interfaith Program. Uh, so for those who have joined us a bit more recently, we are recording this session. Again, if you don't want to be end up in the recording, please keep your microphones and cameras off throughout. Now, it is proverbially said that a picture is worth a thousand words. And apparently this phrase are, uh, articulated the place of photography in early 20th century advertising. Although we find much older, similar statements about paintings being able to express ideas more readily than text. Anthropology has a particularly fraught historical relationship with images as it participated in the violence of colonial practices of representation, objectifying and exoticizing entire groups of people. But visual anthropology has certainly changed and it is now often collaboratively produced with communities studied and uses uh, the visual uh, in imaginative ways to ask questions and make arguments in ways that perhaps might not be entirely possible in the most more conventional genre of ethnography. Uh, visual methods might be better in representing the space and time specific social processes and situations, confronting us with actual places, people, interactions, conditions, materials, and multiple meanings. Visual research perhaps translates other contexts more easily to our bodies. When it comes to religion and interfaith relations, can such work open up spaces for engagement with intensities of ritual, with the everydayness of relations, or the ambiguities, boundaries uh, between religions, with the ineffable, or even with the unknowable of religion. Now, today we're going to test all of these questions by juxtaposing images relating to interfaith relations with 1,000 word presentations. You will hear from six anthropologists, Professor Tom Selvin of SOAS University of London, Dr. Marlene Schaffers of the University of Cambridge, Dr. Reza Masoudi Najad of SOAS University of London, Dr. Sami Everett of the University of Cambridge, Samuel Tetner from the University of Manchester, and me, Safid Haji Mohamedovic from the University of Cambridge, Cambridge Interfaith Program. But we also want to make this a little bit more interactive than just brief presentations. And before each presentation, you will have a minute to look at the image and think of up to seven words of association. It doesn't matter if you don't know what the image is about. Um, the question is, what does it say to you? And when we write these images on whiteboard, it doesn't matter if somebody else has already written the kind of word uh, that you were thinking of. Uh, so we will then have one minute to write these words together anywhere on the Zoom whiteboard, forming a collaborative chain poem. After that, each speaker will deliver their roughly 1,000 word presentation and will answer any questions from you. If you do have a question, just let us know by typing in a star or any kind of comment into the chat room, and then we'll invite you to ask the question afterwards. Uh, until then, please keep your microphones on mute. So to show this uh, little format of ours, I will start us off with my own image, uh, and I will give you first one minute to look at it, and then one minute to write up to seven words of association on the whiteboard.
I would like to briefly take you to the town of Visoko in central Bosnia. If any of you have heard of this town, it is likely because you have read stories about the archaeological hoax which gained international attention uh, in 2005 or since 2005 when a diasporic businessman discovered a few local hills in Visoko to be the oldest and the largest pyramids in the world. This pseudo archaeological project continues to this day with great harm to the actual sites of cultural heritage, a medieval Bosnian castle and Roman fortifications on the same hill, but also another neglected form of actual cultural heritage very close by, uh, which I'm going to talk about today, St. George's Day Festival in Visokom, celebrated by Orthodox and Catholic Christians, Muslims, and Roma people of different faiths, in Bosnia, St. George's Day is a deeply interfaith occasion. Most people observe it according to the Julian calendar on the 6th of May. It is the beginning of the vegetative cycle when landscapes blossom, farm animals can be led to pasture and intricate rituals are conducted. It focuses on movement, rejuvenation and fertility. In the wake of dawn, before the daylight is set, Young women go either to water slopes or water mills and wash in the magical droplets they call Omaha. A number of specific flowers and herbs are picked and mixed with this water for later medicinal use. Girls decorate their front doors with bouquets of hyssop blossoms and boys try to sneak up and steal these bouquets. Swings are tied to old oak trees for children to play on. Everyone ties small red ribbons to branches of Cornell, repeating, I take health, forsake disease. With each ribbon, they also articulate a wish for the prosperity of their loved ones. Children run around stinging each other's legs with nettles. Their games are sometimes interrupted by a quick visit to the spring where they disappear into a crowd of women splashing their faces with water and throwing three driblets over their backs for luck. Women wanting to get pregnant gently lash themselves with willow witties, repeating a rhyme. This year with willow, next year with a belly. Colorful stews are cooked to celebrate the colors of springtime, and so on. In this image, you see a Roma celebration of St. George's Eve in 2012 in the town of Visokom. An estimated 50,000 to 100,000 Roma people live in Bosnia, subjected to systemic and everyday racism. Like other Roma in Europe, they have also been subjected to racist visual representations. If you have seen the work of Emir Kusturica, a celebrated Yugoslav filmmaker, like his films, The Time of the Gypsies or Black Cat, White Cat, you know that cinematography has portrayed Roma as foreign, exotic, and dangerous through corruption, lawlessness, magic, mystery, deep connection to animals, misery, telekinetic powers, alcoholism, healing powers, poverty, happiness, and music. A lot of happiness, a lot of music, somehow made essential to their bodies. So to take a picture of a Roma festival, one in which they're dancing and celebrating around fire is a daunting task. Images may be easily used to perpetuate the wider visual language of violence. In fact, there are different Roma groups in Bosnia with different ethnonyms, different religions, and different languages even. So of these, some of these groups are nomadic, others are sedentary. Signaling their shared coherent identity is then also highly problematic. Civil society organizations often build upon the notion of Roma identity to make strategic arguments against the abuses of their human rights. Another cautionary note is needed. Although this is an image of a Roma St. George's celebration, it is also an image of a celebration of non-Roma, Muslims and Christians, as well as of non-religious people. It belongs to a shared interfaith tradition. Melina, a local Roma activist from Visoko, was happy for everyone to participate, but thought that describing it as everyone's day was wrong. It is a Roma day, she said. We should be proud of our heritage, 
say that we are Roma and that it's our festival. Her words recall the famous Roma song, which goes, Romano dive, amaro dive, ederlesi. Romani day, our day, St. George's day. But even that song has been translated into virtually all the languages of the Balkan Peninsula. It is a Roma day and a Roma song, but everyone else's too. However, one manages to step out of the wider social and political contexts when the cyclical dance around fire begins. Known as kolo, meaning circle or wheel, the dance you see in this image comes in too many varieties to count. I have seen some instances with several hundred participants. Proximity and coordination are important. Joining hands and revolving around a shared vertical axis of the fire, synchronizing your movements to the movements of the dancers next to you, gives the body an opportunity to understand the principles of this cyclical calendar, when the body is asked to realign with the movements of the seasons and the cosmos, awakened to the springtime after a long winter slumber and offered an opportunity to release the accumulated tension before the hard summer labor begins. It may be just the kind of celebration of life we all need after a long period of lockdown and social distancing. Thank you so much for listening to me. Um, have you mentioned when that ritual is practiced? So according to the Georgian calendar, it would be the same as in England. So I think it's what, the 23rd of, of April uh, is St. George's Day. Uh, according to the Julian calendar, it would be the 6th of May. But the rituals start the day or the evening before, really. Um, and so the, the, the image is on the eve of St. George's Day, on the 5th of May. And it was, um, when I took the image, it was uh, the night of perigee, or what's also called the supermoon. Um, and it was quite a, a fantastic um, sort of experience, really. And I will invite Professor Tom Selden to give his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Safet. <clears throat> so my thousand words are entitled Ruth. These words consider what we can learn about interfaith relations from the biblical book of Ruth. Written at the time of the judges in the late Bronze Age, approximately 1000, 1200 BCE, the story of Ruth is set in the city of Bethlehem within a geographical context of the two neighboring kingdoms of Judah and Moab, located as these are on either side of the Dead Sea and River Jordan. One of the underlying themes of the story of Ruth is the relationship between the two kingdoms. Moab and the Moabites have, since those early days and ever since, have had a bad press in the eyes of the Judites. The book, the book of uh, Deuteronomy, chapter 23, verse three, tells us, quote, an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Narratives within the Bible and later commentaries stress the 
enmity and hostility between Judites and Moabites. Judites thought that Moabites were idolaters, worshipping as they did the god Baal, associated with fertility and sexual activity. They thought of Moabite women as sexually depraved and dangerously seductive, and of little positive contact or relations between the two kingdoms. The Book of Ruth, however, offers us a reading that subverts this sense of Deuteron Deuteronomic hostility. The plan here is thus to tell Ruth's story and then consider how that reading is achieved, briefly considering each of six of the story's main themes, namely the role of the stranger, issues of fertility and sexuality, kinship between separate gods, the centrality of hospi hospitality, and the perennial struggle between the worlds of myth and politico-religious rhetoric on the one hand, everyday life on the other. The significance of my single stalk of barley will emerge as we proceed. We might discuss later what contemporary relevance we could make of the story. Ruth begins with the story of a prominent landowning Bethlehemite, Elimelech, which means my God, King in Hebrew, his wife Naomi, pleasant in Hebrew, and their two sons, Machalon and Chilion, leaving their home in Bethlehem and traveling to the neighboring kingdom of Moab. Settling down there, the two sons found Moabite wives, Ruth and Orpah. In the 10 years that followed, Elimelech, Machalon and Chilion all died, leaving Naomi with two widowed daughters-in-law, neither of whom had children. Naomi decided to return to Judah. Ruth accompanied her to Bethlehem. On the outskirts of the city, they came to a field of barley owned by Boaz, a man of substance who was also a distant kinsman of Elimelech, and whose barley was in the process of being harvested. Bethlehemite women asked whether this was the same Naomi who had left with her husband ten years earlier. Naomi responded that it was indeed her, but that she didn't want them to call her Naomi, but rather Mara, bitter, because, she said, the Lord had done some very bad things to her. After all, she had lost her husband and two sons and had no grandchildren. Just then, Boaz himself arrived on the scene and instructed his reapers to make a space in their ranks for Ruth to enable her to glean, i.e. pick up, the stalks and grains of barley that were left behind from the harvesters. He told his male reapers not to touch Ruth and treat her with respect. Ruth, duly and modestly, positioned herself amongst female reapers and spent the day gleaning. After work, she thanked Boaz for his generosity and asked him why he had, been glean why, why, uh, he had allowed her to glean um, and why he had been so kind to her as a stranger. And he replied that he greatly admired Ruth's selflessness in looking after her mother-in-law. We may add that he was also following biblical law as enunciated in Leviticus, quote, when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest, for thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. In the evening, Naomi suggested that Ruth should wash, perfume herself, and wear her best night clothes, and when Boaz lay down to sleep, position herself at the foot of his bed uncovering his feet as she did so. Boaz didn't notice Ruth until midnight when he was surprised to see a woman at his feet and asked her who she was. Ruth explained, adding that she was his near kinsman and asking him to spread his skirt over her. In the morning, he measured out six measures of barley and told Ruth to take the corn to her mother-in-law. He then announced to the city's elders that he, Boaz, would buy all the land previously owned by Elimelech Chilion and Machlon, and marry Ruth, Machlon's wife, quote, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. The elders agreed. So Boaz took Ruth and she was his wife. And when he went into her, uh, this is quotation, when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. The Bethlehemite women then told Naomi that she now had a grandson who would ensure the continuation of the line of Elimelech. Now to the six themes. Her book refers to Ruth as the Moabites. As such, she appeared as a stranger in Judah. As a stranger, she is permitted and encouraged to glean. This is where my barley stalk fits in. Secondly, Ruth was probably post-menopausal, and her son, Obed, 
was conceived with divine intervention. Thirdly, Deuteronomists might have liked to shut out ideas of intermarriage between Moabites and Judites. In fact, as recent scholars have confirmed, they were probably common. And of course, Ruth's story uh, is the prime example of that. Fourthly, Moab was home to important staging posts on what has become known as the King's trading route across the region. And mutual trade between the two kingdoms probably flourished. Fifthly, the engagement of the city's elders in the marriage of Boaz and Ruth emphasize its significance for Bethlehem's society as a whole. Lastly then, the book of Ruth reaffirms the principles underlying the epic story in Genesis of Abraham and the three angels, and thus asserts once again the necessary primacy in interfaith relations between neighbors and strangers, namely hospitality, and through that, the resurrection of a patrilineage, which was to lead in time to King David and Jesus. In, in a sense, uh, you know, one has to completely transpose into kind of another, uh, not only another kind of landscape, but another um, kind of calendar, another kind of relationship to land in order to, to understand what that stalk of barley might mean. Um, and I was wondering whether, you know, we are too estranged from stalks of barley to understand the kind of symbolic importance uh, that it has in this narrative? Um, well, interestingly, I suppose one reply could be that if uh, you remember, which uh, most people here won't, but uh, dur during the time of the Second World War and just after, the practice of gleaning was actually quite common. And therefore, the, um, the, the, the barley stalk uh, would have uh, possibly come to mind um, as something that uh, brought uh, gleaning to mind. I mean, I, I, I actually was a, a very small child. And I remember uh, in 1946, 47, 48, um, there was still gleaning going on in East Sussex. Um, and this was a practice which did lead to... to, to uh, to food, uh, to corn, uh, being delivered to the village. Um, and so it was quite, it was quite interesting. But I think from that time onwards, probably, um, there hasn't been a great deal of feeling. So in that sense, we would be really, I do suppose. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we have uh, time for another question or two, um, if you'd like to. Lisa's got one. Lisa would like to share some. Oh, Lisa, please do. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks, Prof. Tom, for uh, talking about the land of, of the land of the Bible and bringing the, the um, story of Ruth. So here I am sharing with you this. Mm. I just collected it from our field. I come from Beth Bahur, from Bethlehem. Uh, I just live kilometers from Ruth's field. So now here in my town, we have this. It's the season, it's, so I just wanted to add this to add to the story of Prof. Tom to show its origins. Can I respond, Safet? Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, I, as you know, um, I work in Bethlehem quite a lot and I'm very conscious of, uh, and one of my, one of my best uh, uh, colleagues um, has a restaurant in Betzahor called Ruth. Yeah, yeah. That's and cool. and he, he is regarded as the Mukhtar of uh, Betzahor, I think. Yeah, uh, he's, uh, yeah, he's Dr. Zrami's father. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so one, um, that again reverts back to Safet's question in a sense. So, um, in this context, um, one does uh, come across the, the barley. The barley becomes uh, very live. And also, if I may uh, just re remind everybody that I did say that uh, we might discuss later what contemporary relevance we could make of the story. And uh, I might just add that uh, from the view of the fields where Boaz and Ruth may have been, uh, what one sees is the huge wall between Israel and Palestine, cutting off the relations between them. 
And in that sense, the Book of Ruth, I think, that speaks of the interchange uh, between Moab and, uh, and Judah is highly relevant in the contemporary world. So um, thanks a lot for inviting me here. Um, and uh, time is running, so I'll try to be brief, even though obviously there is there is a lot to say um, about an image like this um, and about all the images. Um, but so what do you what do you see here? It's funny that it's um, it's an image that's in a way quite similar, I think, to what Safed showed. Um, and maybe that's something also to reflect about, um, you know, why, why it's these kind of images that, that come up. But what you can see here, um, even though it looks quite similar actually to what, what Safa shared, um, the context is, is quite different. So this is a group of Kurds and Armenians dancing together in September 2012 on the island of Akhtamar, um, which is situated in Lake Van in Eastern Turkey. So this is close to the Iranian border and not far from the Armenian border. So in the very East um, of Turkey. And um, the island is the site of the Armenian Ahtamar church um, where um, in September, 2012, when I um, took this photograph, um, a Christian, um, an Armenian mass was celebrated by the Armenian patriarch um, on the island in that church, um, which is of quite, um, import, uh, of quite high importance for the Armenian community. Um, and that service, church service took place with the authorization of the Turkish government. Um, and it was a very, very rare occurrence. Um, and there have been a few cases um, since then, because um, there was a peace process going on at this time, since then conflict has resumed. So right now these um, services are no longer happening. Um, and so for this service, um, hundreds of Armenians from Western Turkey, from the Republic of Armenia, um, and from the Armenian diaspora in Europe and North America came to visit uh, Van. Now, um, Van is today mainly inhabited by Sunni Muslim Kurds. Um, uh, but it is a region, um, so today um, amongst Kurds, uh, Van is known as part of what they call Northern Kurdistan. Um, but it is actually a region with a history of Kurdish and Armenian coexistence. Um, so while Kurds know this region as Northern Kurdistan, Armenians would often describe it as Western Armenia. And then Turks would describe it as Eastern Turkey, which already tells you something about the contested nature of this space. Um, now Van was predominantly Armenian um, until the 1915 genocide. Um, and, the, and so the town um, in particular was, um, the numbers vary, but more than 50% uh, Armenian and so was the countryside. Um, and so the genocide in 1915 obviously um, basically wiped out Anatolia's um, Armenian populations. Um, so currently there are no uh, open Armenian communities left in this part of Turkey. Nevertheless, um, Van's uh, landscape today bears witness to this Armenian past. Um, so the whole landscape is dotted with crumbling churches, decaying tombstones, ruined monasteries, um, which in turn have become building material to sustain Kurdish homes. So when you go to villages, you often find stones drawn from churches or monasteries that are reintegrated into Kurdish houses. Um, but the shared Armenian Kurdish past also persists in immaterial forms. Um, for instance, in shared dances and songs, as you can see on the photo, um, a lot of the folk repertoire um, is shared by Armenians um, and Kurds. And so dancing together is something that comes very naturally and is, you know, people fall into the same rhythm um, you know, they sing lyrics in Kurdish and Armenian to the same song. Um, the, this shared history also persists in shared food, in shared culinary um, traditions, in oral histories, um, in some shared vocabularies, expressions, and so on. Now, 
while the Turkish state continues to um, deny the Armenian genocide, Kurds have a very different relation to the genocidal past, given that the remains of the Armenian um, historical present forms such an intimate presence in their everyday lives. Um, you, you know, there's no way that um, you could deny the Armenian genocide, given that the Armenian past is so present in the landscape um, today. And, and this Armenian past is really um, present through its very absence. So it's through the decaying churches, monasteries, and so on, that the genocide itself becomes a fact. Now, in recent years, this intimate knowledge of the Armenian genocide um, has found expression in a discourse of common victimhood amongst a lot of Kurds. So many Kurds regard the Armen Armenian genocide as the result of the same nationalist logic that has also led to the discrimination, oppression, and violence against Kurdish communities in the country. Um, so Kurds somehow see themselves um, together with Armenians as kind of natural allies against what they sometimes um, express as a common enemy, the Ottoman state or the Turkish state being sort of a common enemy that unites um, Kurds and Armenians um, in, a in a shared history of suffering um, and oppression. Now, having done extensive fieldwork uh, in the region of Van, I have observed that this Im imagined bond of common suffering across these two ethnic and religious communities is in fact extremely fragile um, and, it's and it has its limits. And I think that this fragility can shed light on the difficulty of forging interreligious relations in the context of a history that is laced with instances of um, state and political violence and that is very much ongoing. So for one, we should not forget that the history, uh, we should not forget the history of Kurdish complicity in the genocide. Um, so Kurdish tribes were recruited by the Ottoman leadership um, to carry out um, part of the deportations and killings of Armenians. And while by far not all Kurdish tribes participated in this, a good number um, of them did so. Now that history um, of, the, of the Armenian genocide and what happened to Kurdish and Armenian communities is often interpreted in quite different ways. So where Kurds speak of how they saved Armenian children from the slaughter by taking them into their homes and protecting them, Armenians speak of them, of these children as being kidnapped um, or raped even. So there's quite a different understanding of history um, on those two sides. Um, another example is that where Kurds are proud of having preserved Armenian churches by using them as barns or a storage room, um, you know, adjacent to their own houses, Armenians are often shocked by what appears to them as a form of desecration of, uh, of sacred space when, you know, Kurdish families use those churches as just, you know, to put their sheep or something like that. Um, and even seemingly shared musical repertoires do not integrate as smoothly as one might imagine. So as I discovered during an exchange project between Kurdish and Armenian um, female singers, um, these repertoires, which seem very similar on the surface, have actually cons consolidated in different national contexts, so in Armenia and in Turkey, leading to subtle but important differences in rhythm, pitch, and melody. Um, and so <clears throat> I think that these misunderstandings, even though there's this, um, this idea, uh, this imagination, particularly on the Kurdish side, that you know, there's a shared history of suffering um, and, um, and victim, victimhood that brings Kurds and Armenians together, and it does in instances, as you can see on the photograph, um, these sort of misunderstandings that occur when Kurds and Armenians actually encounter each other um, point to the limits of a discourse of common victimhood and to the fact that pain and suffering is not an ahistorical experience that effortlessly translates across communities. Um, but rather than interpreting such limits as evidence for the impossibility um, of Kurdish and Armenian cross-ethnic and interreligious relations, I think what this allows us to see is the immense social labor that is necessary to create empathy, to make pain and suffering intelligible across the boundaries of ethnicity, religion, and historical experience. Um, and through that social labor to arrive at scenes like the one that you see on the photograph, where actually bodies come together in the same rhythm um, and share a space together. So um, I'll stop here. I think I've used up my time. Um, thanks a lot. And I look forward to your questions. It's, it's sort of an unexpected narrative, really, to what one sees in the image. Um, and uh, it's, I think you've managed to kind of pack a lot of this history uh, into a kind of a brief presentation, particularly when one thinks of these various kinds of remnants uh, kind of built into 
you know, built into other structures that then also become remnants and that have to be negotiated. Um, and I wonder if, uh, you know, what, what kind of a definition of cultural heritage that would produce for us if we have to think about these kind of forms of negotiation that are always kind of embedded in very different ways. Like, does, does it do anything to cultural heritage studies? Um, yeah, thanks for that question. I think it does um, in the sense that um, I think, you know, when you when you look at cultural heritage, really sort of at, at, as it occurs or it's lived as it's experienced at the boundary of com communities that is extremely contested and really sort of haunted by these stories, histories of violence. Um, the very fact, what is cultural, what is even considered cultural heritage becomes itself an extremely um, loaded question, right? So for instance, at church, is it an instance of cultural heritage? Is it an active site of worship? Or is it, you know, um, just a building that people can make use of? Um, and, sh you know, uh, in the absence of, given that the region is extremely poor, you know, could you say that whatever Kurdish peasant family should be allowed to, you know, make use of that building in whatever way. So, you know, even just, um, you know, at, at the boundaries of these communities that have such different relationships to these remnants, what is it that is even, you know, is what can you even consider heritage becomes an extremely contested question and a process of negotiation. And this is really what I'm trying to highlight is that, um, you know, there is a lot of social labor that even goes into you know, achieving something as, you know, a common understanding of what is it even that we start from as a basis, what's our common, you know, historical um, infrastructure from where we can start, you know, to, to even move further. Even that requires a lot of social, social labor and investment. Thanks, uh, Safad, for having me. Uh, um, in that image, uh, I, I'm going to talk mainly about one idea or concept, but I hope that <clears throat> the image would be challenged also, the image of Muslim women here and showing in a colorful and very diverse color in a very crowded situation. However, particularly, I would like to focus on the idea of diversity here, which I hope that, the, you know, the, 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 the women dress are just also representing such diversity. I'm going to explain briefly what you've seen in that image and I'll go through my, my points here. Uh, this is taken during my field work in Mumbai and my research was uh, focused on the idea of ritual and city and diversity of the state. And the key point that I'm trying to focus here is just uh, advising that we shouldn't reduce or commit the complex reality of society by using a stereotype terminology like Muslim, the Muslim community or the Shia communities. There is no such things. There are Muslim communities. So my main point that I try to articulate here is why is my, that's my point here. Uh, the image uh, I was taking it during the, the commemoration of an event called Ashura Day, which is uh, mainly is commemorated by Shia Muslims uh, as a day of uh, tragic, even in seventh century when the grandson of Prophet Muhammad and his few companions being brutally killed uh, over a political dispute. The Ashura tragedy is one of, not the only, but one of uh, the historical events that established the division between Shia and Sunnis. 
Although in the Middle East, normally the, the commemoration of Ashura Day is associated with the Shia communities, but in India is an entirely different context. Uh, a, for example, the city of Bombay, uh, or Mumbai that we call it today, it was known for the Ashura commemoration or Muharram rituals, because it was the, the most important uh, festival, annual festival of the city. The image that you can see, it is the, the, the gathering of a community called Bora community, locally they call them Bori. They are a, a, a trader, Gujarati, Ismaili, Shia Muslims who been dispersed all over the world during the colonial time. And, but still Mumbai remains the, the, the capital culture. So in that occasion, they, these individuals coming from all over the place to attend on the, the service session of Ashura Day when their spiritual leader delivered his annual ceremony. And so for them, it is a kind of, they are, is a kind of pilgrimage as some of you, you actually point out. And that's why actually I, made, I had a chap, book chapter based on this community of, which I call it pilgrimage to ritual because normally we pilgrims Pilgrimage is about to, to go to a place where is the holy place, for example, and it's a fixed place. But for these communities, wherever their spiritual leader delivers the ceremony, they all coming from all over the place to that particular location. So it is not about one place, but it's about a ritual. So they are pilgrims towards a ritual. But the, the, other point, the main point that I'm trying to explain here is, uh, while the, during the colonial uh, time, we often, in India, we often talk about Sunni against Hindus or, or basically Muslim communities in as a whole, there was no such thing even in 19th century in Mumbai. First of all, the ritual, the, even the Ashura day was celebrated by all Muslims and Hindus. The city was, became a cosmopolitan city within a short period of time when the large number of different social, ethnic, and you know, ethnic group just pouring into the city, encountering each other. And although there was a huge number of different Muslims coming to, to the city, for example, I would call them like from the Arabs, the Turks, the Iranian, Punjabis, Lahuris, Kashmiris, Madrasis, Gujaratis, Dakanis, and Konkanis, these are all different kinds of social, religious Muslim groups but they never accept to be collapsed and indistinguished from, be, became a one group, indistinguished group called the Muslims. There was no such thing. And for, in order to, 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 to they keep and practice their own separate identity, Muharram ritual was extremely important, I would say medium during 19th century, even today. So when they arrive in Mumbai, in country to other Muslims or other Shias, and I have to say there is no other city in the world that you can find so many different Shia communities. For example, these communities, the Boros, are Ismaili Shias, but they are not following Aga Khan as normally people they know. So they are called Musta'ali Shia. So there are, there are so many different Shia communities with a different faith and ethnic background. So basically in that context, often, the ethnic diversity multiplied by a social and religious diversity. So it created a very complex landscape. And the ritual, so that, for example, the Shia community, although they keep their own kind of intimacy with other Shia Muslims, however, at the same time, they keep their own separate identity and ritual. For doing that, even they change their rituals. Because basically identity and ritual are all about defining the identity based on what we are basically encountering with. So a, a, a Bora community in Gujarat is totally different when they, they arrive in Mumbai. So here, what is, you obviously can see, although it is Ashura day, but there is no other Shia Muslim in that event. So this extremely exclusive ritual, you, it is a huge crowd, more than 100,000 people are gathering now, but in the heart of the old city of Bombay is that that place is called Bendibaza. However, no other Shia community have ever been, been allowed even to attend because this is an exclusive event to practice the social solidarity among the Boras. 
and which it is obviously is extremely unusual experience. And for me, for example, attending on that situation was, I have to net networking for one year to be allowed to attend in the event as a known borer. I would say I was possibly the only person apart from the TV crew who filming the event. I was the only non borer member of such a huge crowd. And interestingly, again, although these are extremely orthodox community, every single person you can see here, they have been registered by email to attend to the event. So it is an extremely complex social organization behind that situation. And as I said, the Shia community and all of the community try to keep their own separate identity. I will explain, it's not just about having exclusive uh, event like this. Interestingly, this community, because their faith originated in Fatimid, Egypt, the, in order to calculate Ashura, which is the 10th of Muharram, a, a lunar Arabic or Islamic calendar, they are not using common lunar calendar. They're using the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian calendar. So they calculate the month slightly differently. Therefore, although they all, they all Shia come celebrate or commemorate Ashura day, but the way that they calculate it became the way like, for example, the Borak celebrate the day of Ashura on Monday, and the rest of the celebrated on Tuesday. So it was obviously convenient for me because I was able to attend in two Ashura days in one year because I attended in the Boras community ritual, for example, in that day and the day after was the rest. So I was able to observe both kind of day. So you can see how it's complex. Uh, my, I'm gonna brought it back to all here at home here in the UK. Is it only the case in Mumbai that we are facing such complex uh, social fabric? But definitely not. This is the case also in London, where uh, Steve Vetrovich actually coined the term of super diversity to describe the reality of the social fabric of London. Although we keep using terms like Muslims, the Asians, the black community, there is no such things. There are Muslim communities, there are black communities. We shouldn't reduce these complexity in a very simple and lazy categories. Therefore, I would suggest that policymakers, uh, they definitely have to avoid those simplistic reductionist terms like a black, Asian, Muslim, or Christian, you know, community that we widely and commonly we use in all kinds of survey forms, that they are totally artificial and they are not able to capture and represent the reality of all complex society. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Reza. Uh, it, it feels partly a, like a comment on the, the kind of violence of these categories that we're currently experiencing with the census here in the UK. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but uh, so this, uh, I will let everybody else uh, try to ask a question or not everybody else. Uh, if anybody has a question, we have time for maybe two. Uh, hi, Reza. Um, hi. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I just wanted to know a little bit more. Uh, at, the, at the very beginning, you spoke about Muharram as a, as a city festival. So it's actually, uh, it's completely inclusive. In fact, in, in that sense, it doesn't have a like at least a Western religious connotation. Um, could you explain a little bit more about that? I mean, is does is that does that become formal? Is is the is, is the city involved with the celebration of Muharram? Uh, I'm I'm just curious. Uh, I mean, the, I mean the, I'm using urban ritual as a conceptual term because in my huge, I mean, a major part of my research has been focused on explaining how rituals and religious rituals in particular are involved in urban process, in the process that different countries negotiating each other to shape and reshape urban society. That's me, the reason that I'm using. So I'm not using rituals as a religious or even social practice, I will call it urban practice. That's my, my basic point. The other point in, in the case of Mumbai, interestingly, because even during colonial time, Ashura Day was a public holiday and it remained the same. So, so basically the city is just, is, is a city is in entire India. Ashura Day is a holiday. And however, I mean, obviously I extensively published on these topics while during 19th century it was inter-community ritual where the Sunni, the Shias and the Hindus been involved with the ritual. 
during colonial time and policy that imposed on the city. There is a huge history on that. Gradually, ritual in Mumbai, not in other cities, became a Shia ritual. So today, if you go to Mumbai, although the whole city would be changed into a ritual scene, the ritual was predominant, is pre predominantly practiced predominantly, not entirely, by Shia Muslims. However, during 19th century, even it was Sunni's country who claimed the authority over the ritual. So for example, when Iranian arrive in Mumbai, they want to practice their own ritual. A Sunni committee make a case against them in the court and claiming the authority over ritual. And they say, this Shia committee arrived, they want to change your rituals. So you can imagine how, but obviously that is long history, but over the time that landscape is changed. I have to say that's the particularly the case of Bombay, but if you go to other Indian city like Delhi or any other city, it still is a kind of intercommunity ritual. Even in Mumbai, in Dharavi slums, that's it because if Dharavi is a slum, it's a, it still is ex excluded from the rest of the city. In Dharavi in particular, it's still the, the, the old community are practicing, the Shia and the Muslim practicing Muharram together. But in the actual, the old city and the main, the other part of the city, the ritual is mainly Shia, pre predominantly practiced by Shia Muslims. So we'll take uh, one more brief question from Amra and one more brief reply from Reza, uh, because we have to go on with the other presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Reza, very much. This, um, in fact, provoked a lot of associations to the Bosnian celebration of Ashura, which is a sort of double meaning. Uh, the one is linked with the Noah bark and flood that is celebrated through special cooking of different kinds of seeds and celebrating diversity, natural diversity and diversity of the world through that, and also through mourning concerning the destiny of the Prophet's family. But my question here is linked directly to the photo. At the photo, we can see women, or majority of women. I have been trying to find out if there is a, a, a male person and there is one at the balcony. Can you explain? Uh, if if, if Satan can show the image again, I will explain. Well, here you, you can see that there is a, uh, a gender segregation during the ritual. If you look at the back, you can see at the kind of white area. Those are men on the background, but in front, they are all women. There is no men here. So it is a, a clear, if you can see my, my arrow, it, this is the edge. So the here, all men in the white dress like this man who's here, but the front are all uh, ladies. That is the chant of the Nana affiliated to the Breslova Hasid followers of the Rabbi Nachman of Hatzlav from the 18th century. In this picture, you see above, or rather in the street sign, you see 
19th arrondissement, 19e arrondissement, the 19th district in the northwest of Paris, Rue Petit, Little Street, if you want to translate it. And then you see a sticker with a smiley face on it, in which it says, Rior Samer Famid Manser. A happy smile is always victorious. And below that, there's another uh, sticker that I can't read. We see different colors in this street sign. We see green and blue, the yellow of the sticker, the white of the sticker directly below it, and the gray of the mortar. Opposite this street sign, there is a cash converters. Many of the Nana movement work in the cash converters. Next to the cash converters is a barber shop run by and for the local Chabad Lubavitch community known as Les Luba in French. To the east of this sign, there's a phone shop called Naxantel run by a couple of Moroccan guys who are traditionalist Jewish, the Tradi, as we say in French. To the east of this sign is a very large complex called the Bet Chaya, Mushka, a school, a synagogue, and a cultural center. Due south of the street sign is La Mairie, the mayoral offices, the most diverse in terms of the place in which people were born and the languages they speak. Further, further south is the park Les Buttes Chaumont, built on a rock high above the 19th district. It's a bobo, bourgeois, bohème, bourgeois, bohemian hangout for the Parisian Chichi. It's also where the Cellule du Butchaumont, the Butchaumont cell, are plotted their attacks on Charlie Hebdo and the Hyper Cacher. To the north of this street sign are Lebanese and Maghribi eateries. Further north, the Canal Ourc that provides commercial traffic into and out of the city. Further north still, Rue de Tanger. Tangier Street, with its eponymous cultural center for Maghribi working men. Rue Tanger is known for its mosque Adawa, which has been closed since 2006, testifying to the problems around the construction of Muslim spaces in the Parisian cityscape. This sign is ubiquitous in France, they're everywhere. Rue Petit chooses the name of a colonial military man. The black or the street sign was posed in 1844. It testifies to the Francophone and Osmanian grandeur of the epoch. But there's a disconnect between Rue Petit and the Nana sticker below it, a kind of interruption between the la francophonie and the Hebrew below it and the characters below that. The reason I wanted to show you this photo, which as somebody said in the whiteboard, I took in passing, was that interfaith is often governed by people who are, well, into faith, into faith. And faith, of course, is a problematic category in itself. Sometimes it elides the socio-cultural complexity of the urban circumstance. So the photo is a snapshot. It shows the internal pluralism, like Reza was saying, to the different Jewish communities and movements in Paris, the Nanach, Breslovers, part of a broader group. 
juxtaposed with the Lubavitch group. Again, juxtaposed a few doors down with a traditionalist uh, uh, working class uh, man's shop and the liberals that go to the park and enjoy the long summer evenings in Paris from the springtime. Spatially too, there's diversity. The park, Rue Petit, Rue de Tanger. But there's a disconnect between the naming practices of these streets that seem to be entirely abstracted from their circumstance. And linguistically too, there's a great diversity. Look at the juxtaposition between the Hebrew and the French. Look at the juxtaposition between the symbols and Rue Petit. And then finally, aesthetically, there's a great diversity in this rather bland photo. There's the blue, the Osmanian blue and green, the yellow of the Nachmanian, the white of what looks like something that might be extraterrestrial, and the gray of the mortar that fills the crack below the street sign. Thank you very much, Sami. Uh, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, so uh, we have one short question in the chat room about uh, the way you started your presentation. If you could speak to that a little bit. And then if anybody else has a question, please indicate in the chat room. Um, um, sure, so I mean, I'm not sure what a prayer is exactly, but um, if you're thinking liturgically, then no. Um, it's more of a cantique, uh, like a chant. Um, so something that, uh, depending on the context you know best, uh, might look like a monastic chant or a Buddhist chant. Um, and it's something that the Nanach group, as I said, that's an offshoot of Breslov, um, Breslova Judaism is, is famed for. And um, it's often accompanied by music. And, um, and as somebody pointed out on the whiteboard, the kind of a happy vibe. These are kind of um, the acid jazz community uh, within the community um, of, of Preslova. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, in terms of kind of these interventions into the public space, do people have to find, because it's a very particular conversation in France, um, for quite a, a few decades now uh, in relation to, to religion, you know, usually sort of defined against uh, or in relation to Muslim bodies and a lot of conversations. But, so I was wondering whether, you know, people are searching for different ways to kind of, uh, to communicate through public space. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a very particular kind of intervention um, that, has its roots in kind of contemporary urban culture, right? Stickers, graffiti, um, and so forth. And and there's a there's a in this particular instance. I mean, I'm not sure I can speak to the broader. I mean, your question is quite broad, and and I'm not sure I can speak to the particularities of the Muslim body. I mean, what I can say is that I think those questions are intertwined um, in terms of this perception of a Muslim body being orthodox, um, but also a kind of concatenation of Arabness and religiosity. And that some, some of those same things are felt certainly among um, groups such as this one, where a lot of young guys of North African descent have moved towards a more orthodox way of life. One that's not at all traditionalist or from from back home, from or at least if, if North Africa is back home now, um, but um, so there's I th I think the same kind of dynamics of representation exist around, if you like, the Orthodox Jewish body in in many ways.
Thank you so much, Safed, and for having me and for allowing me to share about this uh, experience that I had while taking this photo. Um, what we see in this photo is a, a Sufi group. I'll just briefly say a bit about Sufism in case any, anybody doesn't know. You can very broadly think about Sufism as the spiritual or the contemplative side to Islam, uh, with the Sharia being more the norms, the everyday norms that must be performed. And th this uh, spiritual or more inner looking dimension of Islam started getting coalesced uh, around different orders or brotherhoods, Tukrut, Tariqas, in the 10th to 12th century. Um, the one that we're following here is the Naqshbandi, which ended up being one of the largest today. It's named after Naqshband, who was a Persian Sufi from the 14th century. And the, trans the Sufi networks were always very transnational. So the Naqshbandi teachers or the grand sheikhs started in Persia, then one branch went towards India, came back towards Central Asia, uh, was in what is Dagestan, today in Russia for many, many years, and eventually went down to the Ottoman Empire um, to where it is today, which is in Cyprus. So the current base of this branch of Naqshbandi Sufism is based on Cyprus, Northern Cyprus, and it's the Naqshbandi Haqqani um, subdivision. In Spain, where, where this photo was taken, this community, which is the Barcelona-based community, started in 1997. Even though there's a long tradition of Islam and Sufism in Spain, this is more located in the south, where there was more geographical influence of Islam. In Barcelona, it's, it's Islam and let's say Sufi practice, it can be seen as a sort of a new age revival um, movement. So this tradition is constructed to be seen as to have a long history, but we can, we can see its real Im impact or presence in the last 20 or 30 or 40 years. Uh, it's funny because I saw that one of the words that, that was on the, on the whiteboard was white. And I think that the person meant in terms of the color of the photo, but there is something to say about the whiteness of the people as a cultural category, because most of the members of this community are Catalan converts towards Islam. So uh, Spanish people that converted into Sufism, I would say something like 80% of the community is converts. There are, of course, uh, Moroccans, Pakistanis, and Algerians or other North Africans who are Sufi, let's say from family tradition, but most of this community is uh, Catalan men and women who at some point in their life um, felt the dissatisfaction with the Western model, people who were brought up and raised in capitalist Western urban society felt that they needed something more. And with the lack of something else that was filling that hole, they turned towards Sufism. When I was studying this community, it ended up very lucky that the master, the one that lives in Cyprus that I just mentioned, he came to Spain for the second time in history. So it was a very important occasion that I happened to witness. And we went on a road trip from Barcelona to the south where, where he was gonna do his visits to different historical Islamic sites, offer prayers, offer, um, yeah, offer prayers to, in different in, in tombs of different saints. So I joined the community and I went with them on this road trip from Barcelona towards the south of Spain. It's about 2000 kilometers. And we traveled around with the master and of course, when you're on this road trip, somebody else wrote, yeah, prayer times when, when you're on the road. Of course, when you're on the road and it's Salat time, you have to stop wherever, wherever it, it happens. So in this photo, we see the, the Sufi community in, uh, this is the highway between Sevilla, Seville and Madrid. And uh, the Salat time came, so we got down and, and they did it. Of course, something else that is very present uh, visually that somebody else wrote is that the separation of the genders. So this demarcation of physical space according to gender um, roles or traditions in Islam is very present in this in this photo uh, as well, even if it happens to be in a in a parking lot, which was the case in this photo. And um, I don't know how much time I have, but I could maybe say something about space in um, in Sufism and why it's important. Yes. So. In, 
Yeah, so and so in Sufism, there's an interesting relationship, three way relationship between space or place, because Makam, Makam is the is a name that is given to the place where a Sufi saint is buried, and the spiritual energy emanates from the place. So the the spiritual the spiritualness that comes from a Sufi master is located on earth physically, geographically, in the place where he is buried. Um, Makam also in the spiritual sort of cosmology, the way that one evolves towards becoming a better person. There, there are different stations that are, these are called makams. Within the makams, there are other smaller uh, spiritual developments called hal, but the great like steps that one goes through towards becoming a better human being are called makam. So there's also a spatiality towards spirituality. And lastly, in uh, maybe uh, maybe some of you know in uh, in, uh, in Arabic music makam, but it's also in a uh, in, in Sufi music makam is something akin to the notion of a scale in Western notation. So there is also the, the location of the nodes in relation to each other is also important. As for example, somebody like Al Ghazali, who was a very famous Sufi um, theologian. He wrote that there are particular makams and there are particular ways of playing Sufi music that elicit certain feelings that bring one closer to God. And those are allowed to be played in, in Islam. And those makams that don't do that are not. Um, so there's this, tri there's this triple relationship of space and spatialness and sharing space within Sufism and its relation to spirituality. Thank you so much, Samuel. Fantastic. Um, Thank you. Uh, so do I see some hands uh, or questions? Oh, I see the, uh, Jeff. Um, oh, Jeff has left us, but he said it was amazing. So I have a quick question. First of all, I'm in love with this image. Uh, uh, I mean, we, we have all, you know, the ones that came before you in this panel, you know, provided images, but this really feels like visual anthropology in the sense that it asks all of these questions and there's so many things to untangle. I mean, all of the other images were great as well and food for thought, but this one really sort of, I, I felt like I needed to spend an hour with it. Um, and I've seen it before as well. So um, so what I was wondering about is, okay, so you are an artist and an anthropologist, you're doing this visual, is it primarily visual research, um, visual anthropology? That's what I wanted to ask and also, how do you find or position yourself? How do you find this space where you can be, you know, there whilst people are praying, you know, are you then invisible? Do people sort of act for you in certain ways? How does it feel? I just wanted to know a bit more about perhaps that situation. Thank, thanks so much for asking that. Yeah, this is negotiating. This is something that took a while. So I was, um, I did a seven month uh, ethnographic accompaniment of this community. And for the first four months, I was just going, joining the meetings. Uh, I do have a genuine interest in spirituality, and I express that very sincerely. And I managed to to navigate these both of these um, anthropologists and somebody who's seeking something spiritual positions. So in the sense that they always knew that I was an anthropologist, of course, and I was interested in producing something. Um, but I think that I managed to convey to them that I was not just that. So it wasn't because it did come across that somebody said, yeah, anthropologists always come, they want to study us, they look at us like animals. They used this, somebody used this sentence, which was very impacting to me at the time. So I, I wanted to, to navigate that with carefulness. And in terms of methods, yeah, for this, for this project, I used more visual. So this is, this is an image that I took out of the documentary I made about Sufism in, in Spain. But I'm also exploring different methods because of the importance of sound and listening towards Islam, Islamic practice in general, but in Sufism particularly. I want to also uh, explore other sound related methods, yeah. Thank you. Uh, any further questions for Samuel? I guess at this point, yes, Marlena. Uh, yeah, I have a, thanks, this was fascinating. Um, I have a question. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more, because you said there's this, this um, turn or, you know, these white, quote unquote, Spanish people turning, um, converting to Naqshbani Sufism is part of a broader sort of new age um, process of searching or look, looking for spirituality. And so I was wondering if you could say 
something about what makes Nakshibani Sufism in particular attractive um, to people because um, you know from, from the based on the image I think some people on the whiteboard wrote sort of modernity versus modernity versus tradition and so I was thinking like the image like as a comp like when you think of this new age kind of spirituality you think of people doing yoga in bali on the beach and drinking smoothies or something which <laughs> kind of seems very attractive versus praying on you know on the highway it doesn't seem particularly sort of attractive when you look at it sort of from the from you know sort of the outside. i was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what are those people that are converting and why do they convert to this why is it this that sort of seems attractive in this context Sure, yes, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think that for the New Age quest in Europe, first it was more drawn from Eastern spirituality like Indian or Buddhist, but now it's coming to the point where Sufism is getting more, like Rumi is becoming a very prominent um, author in the West. He was like the number one poet a couple of years ago in the US. However, like you said, it hasn't come completely to that point. When, what I meant more in New Age is more of a, uh, a historical separation coming out of Western modernity. So these are people that are disillusioned with, with the way that they were living their life in the West. Many of them, when I interviewed them, they said, uh, all you do is work. The whole point of life in the West is to make money and I don't want to just make money, I want something else. So I'm trying to find something. So I, that's, I attached it more to that, not so much to the aesthetic or the, or the pleasures that, you know, maybe new age religions offer but there is a side to it that is becoming more and more of, of um, latching on to Islamic spirituality or Sufism towards new age movements. I think what makes this Sufism or Nakshwani Sufism interesting to the people that join it for some reason um, Islam has this oppositional perception towards the West so people who are trying to move away from Western capitalism are attracted to Islamic practice. I'm not exactly sure. I think there are people who can tell you why that is much better than me, but I have noticed that it seems like it has this oppositional or confrontational um, position towards it. Okay, so uh, these images, uh, well, you've, you've seen Samuel's image, Marlena's image, uh, uh, the, uh, the, they will be in the exhibition that we are going to open on St. George's Day on 6th of May um, uh, as part, uh, we'll inaugurate the exhibition on shared sacred landscapes um, and we'll have a symposium um, on shared sacred landscapes. So if you want more information of that, we'll be updating sharedsacred.com. And uh, here Reza is back with us. Uh, good to conclude. Uh, I would like to thank you all for joining us for the Cambridge Festival or for this little playful panel. We were figuring out the technology together with you. I uh, hope to see you for some of these other events and uh, particular thanks to all of our wonderful speakers and photographers today. Thanks. Thank you, Safed, for organizing. Yeah, thank you so much. This was great. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry that I left for a few minutes. <laughs> Of course, we completely understand. It's a great well, format, uh, really good. It was, it was very enjoyable. It was fun. We have to work to perfect these changes and shared screens, but otherwise, yeah. I think we're good. That was wonderful. I really enjoy all the old times. Yeah. Enjoy. There's uh, 22 degrees uh, in London or in Cambridge. I hope the weather is good for you as well. Uh, enjoy. Keep safe. See you soon. Thanks, yeah, thanks everybody. Bye.